soup. Definitely not going to keep that in. That whole back and forth there because lose some subscribers. That's a hot topic. Talking that, about that on the internet. No, I think subscribers want to know how we know ball. I think they appreciate that about us. Well, based on my predictions, I don't know ball. Mm. Both of my finals picks were knocked out. Milwaukee in the first round, Golden State in the second round. You picked Milwaukee Lakers, so... Yeah, I'm still 50-50. Yeah, you're still in it. And if Miami wins, then I'm kind of like, well, the Bucks would have been there if Miami didn't take them out. So I can run with that narrative. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's actually a decent narrative to run with. You know Puck? I don't know Puck. <laughs> I know Puck from Berserk. Mm. Little elf, little fairy elf guy, sidekick. I haven't seen that one yet. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Soup Podcast. I am Bo Oliver, joined here today with Aaron, the Nerd Soup Monkey, and we are back to talk about the world of Hollywood, specifically Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, as you saw from the title... We'll also be talking a little U.S. weekend box office and talking about Con 2023. The festival has begun, so oh, not. exciting things to talk about. I thought we were talking about Connor Heroy. No. Yeah. Actually, has a mix. Would have been fun if you went with Connor McDavid, because yeah. you could have brought it back to, do you know Puck? Puck yeah. I know Connor McDavid. I saw somebody comparing his career to Kevin Durant, saying that he needs to go form a super team. They don't do that in hockey, right? No, they do do it in hockey, just nobody cares. But he already has the second best player in the league on his team. Is that Lundqvist? (laughs) No. (laughs) They could could fucking use Lundqvist (laughs) right now. They they suck in goalie? Yeah, I mean, hockey's different, but it's it's getting it's starting to mount where eventually he needs to get it done soon. I would say more LeBron. You heard it here first, Connor B. David. You're on the clock. He's on the LeBron clock. Dude, it frustrates me so much when thinking about 2007, 2008, 2009. He was ready to win chips. And the Cavs just were like, uh, I don't know. I guess you're going to have to do it by yourself. Like, make a trade. <laughs> it took seven years for them to... T- oh, let's not get into that. Yeah. Antoine Jameson. Jesus Christ. Puck, hockey, Guardians. That's what we're talking about. You have uh, social media. Well, you can listen to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. That's nice. And right here on YouTube. And uh, follow us on social media at NerdSoup, at BoSoup, at NerdSoupMonkey on most platforms. And if you're on Blue Sky, send me an invite. Heard about Blue Sky? No. It's the new Twitter. Is it though? Basically the same interface. But But a lot of people are starting the migration. Yeah. It's the early days. But you can only join if you get an invite because it's in beta. Oh, okay. So you can't just sign up. You need somebody who's already been selected. You can enter a pool. It's like a waiting list. But no, it's good business. So if you're out there, seriously, DM me. My, my, my blue sky link. I mean, I'm done with Twitter, so not done, but you've taken a stand. Like a. It's just I don't enjoy it anymore. I don't think I'm funny anymore. Too. I think I've lost my touch. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't know what's going on. Take an improv class. I Improv. Can, I could still, I, I still got it, but I'm just not. Your love for the game isn't there anymore. Yeah. It's really about your love for the game. You know, sometimes you got to spend some time apart to go, grow closer to Twitter. You know what I think would help well, your Twitter mojo? Well, I just go on and I see shit I don't care about or want to see. That and, is like, also an issue I just don't want to open the apps and I'm sc- scrolling and like I, like, I just go back to what it was. It doesn't have to be. Like, White supremacy uh, memes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. It just... No, you get a lot of shit from accounts that you don't follow. It's because two people you follow maybe follow this account. A lot of accounts are being pushed on you. And it's not only for the For You tab. My following tab, I see accounts all the time that I don't follow. <laughs> like, I don't follow these people. Why is it, Why are they in the following tab? It's that. It's like... Well, we're so Twitter brain. Maybe that's a good thing, right? Get out in the world, touch some grass, mm. maybe go on Reddit. Yeah, but it's it's just like... Reddit's fun. Is it? It is. I don't know. When you find a good subreddit, like the Knicks subreddit, so much fun. Well, I used to enjoy like watching games and then going on Twitter and seeing like the live reaction, kind of feel like I'm watching it with people. And that just doesn't happen anymore because of the way, like I'll see shit from like three days ago. I'll see things that I already saw. And it's like, what happened to, I don't know. Yeah, no, it feels like I only get like three or four accounts when it's, uh, it comes to live tweeting a game. And I realize where if it you used clicked, to be every account. If you click an account then you get to see that account more. But sometimes I don't want that because I'm just interested in that individual tweet or that video. I don't want to keep seeing that same thing. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. Maybe I'll get the itch. <laughs> Wait, we'll see what? If I, if, I, if I tweet. Well, maybe somebody will send us a Blue Sky invitation. I think I'm... I'm yeah, I don't know. 
be blue skyers. I wish Twitter was back to like when it was like going to get lunch. That's when it was Twitter. And you'd be like, oh, good lunch. Now it's just a race of who could be funniest or first with things. <laughs> that boy is starving for a viral tweet. Me? Yeah, just go fucking. You, you got drafts? Unload Dude, the drafts. I, I had a draft the other day. Unload the clip. I, then I, I just get in, like, I, I just get like Miller Lite. They had a commercial and people were complaining that I was woke Miller Lite. <laughs> Did you see somebody tweeted Wokenheimer? No. <laughs> um, they didn't give a reason. They were just like, I'm not going to see Wokenheimer. <laughs> that's that's funny. Yeah. But I, was, I had like a draft. It was like uh, my four-year-old son just came up to me with tears in his eyes saying, Daddy, how come all my favorite beers are going woke? <laughs> I was like, ah, I didn't know, what to, didn't know how to reply. I hope you, uh, and I was like, hope you're happy, Obama. <laughs> That was actually a funny joke we had on the Air review that we put on the Patreon. What was it? We were arguing back and forth on whether Air was a dad movie, and my argument was that dads love Michael Jordan. Mm. So we joked that they're sitting on the couch drinking a beer. The kid brings him a Bud oh, yeah. Light, and he smacks it away and says, what do you think we are, a LeBron house? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what Jordan fan just drink a uh, type of whiskey. All right, well, let's just get into, well, yeah, Patreon. Look at that. We've got Patreon podcasts that you guys can listen to and subscribe for just a dollar so some good stuff happening on the patreon i think this week we're going to drop our last of us season one spoiler discussion featuring teddy so and shout out to teddy who always asks me every monday if we want to get together and record a podcast and i respond every monday no ted we're uh working on the succession video so we can't do it no he goes, oh man that's unfortunate it's calculated yeah no he's smart it, when he needs to be because <laughs> he knows that we don't need a monday and yeah he wants to look Makes like he's look putting good. forward uh right putting an effort yeah he's thinking ahead that's a change all right well let's get into it guardians of the galaxy volume three i would say this is one of the more anticipated phase five mcu movies one of the first i guess and uh it completes the trilogy so this is what their second or third completed trilogy <laughs> i'm doing the joke because yeah, yeah, uh, i think i'll do this the again. Man when we yeah, yeah. I, I totally forgot well, Aaron, what did you think? Big fan of the first one. Like the second one. I mm-hmm. think we're pretty much aligned when it comes to that. So this was one of the last superhero movies in general that you were anticipating, wasn't it? Yeah, I think with Guardians, it's always, I don't know. I, I think the first one is easily top five in the MCU, if not top two. Um, and, you know, the second one I did enjoy, but I don't, I don't think it really, it's definitely top like half of MCU, but I wouldn't put it up there with one. And I think with this one coming in, I was excited because it kind of did feel like it was, even though Phase 4 is over, I feel like this kind of should have been the end of Phase 4 because it really is wrapping up that kind of... What are you doing? I'm trying to find a place for this spoon. I don't want it in my cup anymore. Just throw it on the floor. Yeah, I'm just going to... Yeah. It's on the floor. <laughs> nice. Um, but it kind of did feel like it is an end of an era, like the old MCU, and they're kind of... When the movies were good. Yeah. Just kidding. I'm not going to be one of these guys. <laughs> no, uh, I still have enjoyed a lot of uh, some of the Phase 4 projects, and I am optimistic going forward. But, you know, Guardians, I think, was really a surprise and has become a staple when you think of Phase 2 into the end of the Infinity Saga. And I think they kind of operate in a, a different area than a lot of MCU films. Obviously, it's more cosmic, but I think these characters really can hold their own and don't really have to be a part of the larger MCU. It was fun to see them in Endgame and Infinity War and unnecessary as Guardians of the Galaxy thing that lasted for 10 minutes. But when they're on their own, I think there's such so much there to get into. Oh, you mean the Thor thing? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, going in, I was super excited and I think it was right up there with the first one. I, I really enjoyed this one. I think it's a perfect cap for this story and it, i was i was sad like leaving the theater and going home and kind of the rest of that night not that like i didn't enjoy it or obviously there is like sad moments in the movie but kind of just wow this is it for the guardians of the galaxy in 2015 i i didn't even know who the Gal- guardians of the galaxy were and now i just feel like there's there's such a big part of what I loved about the MCU and kind of seeing it quote unquote wrap up because I do think there is, we're going to see a lot of these characters again, but for their own story, for it to be over, James Gunn moving on, like in that sense, I was like really depressed about it. Yeah. They're definitely a diamond in the rough when it comes to superhero franchises. They're like the Steph Curry of (laughs) superhero franchises. Nobody expected anything out of them. And all of a sudden they're the face of the league. Right. And it was around the same time, 2014, 2015, dropping 50 at the garden. 
But yeah, the chemistry has been there since the very beginning. The casting has been there since the very beginning. All these actors were so wonderfully cast, and they seem to really like working for James Gunn. I mean, they stood by him after he was fired from Marvel and then rehired to complete the trilogy. And I think, yeah, it was a perfect cap for their story. I think it it does feel like we could have spent more time with these characters. It's like we just met them and they're going away. But I I appreciated how mature it was at times. Uh, You know, it dealt with themes that you don't really see in these movies about growing apart and moving on and accepting yourself for who you are. You know, that's a bit more cliche, but they went about it in a darker way, especially focusing on Rocket Raccoon. You know, they've hinted at his origins, what he went through, the experiments, but you get an up-close and personal view with uh, all the trauma that he's been dealing with and uh, the villain performance is what stood out the most to me. Oh, yeah. Um, From Chuck Woody Iwuji, who was also in James Gunn's Peacemaker. He played the um, another alien in that. So it was cool to see him go from hero to now villain. And he stole the show from me, dude. He was hateable from the very first scene that you see him. It's one of those topics that's becoming really hard for me to stomach is cruelty towards animals. One of the best movies that came out last year, according to critics, was EO about a donkey who apparently is adorable, but he has a rough go of it. And I don't want to see the donkey be abused and I want to see the donkey be happy. So those are movies that I do shy away from. So some of the scenes in this were hard to watch, dude. Yeah. Really hard to stomach. And they stick with you. But I think the way it all came full circle there at the end was pretty beautiful. And we're getting into spoilers here, but the balls on James Gunn, that's that's why you get one guy to write and direct your trilogy because he's going to make the decision to focus on the best character who also happens to be a talking raccoon. I think a lesser director or another director would say, we have to focus on Peter Quill. He's Chris Pratt. He's the biggest star. He's the human character. It makes the most sense to wrap it up with, you know, tie the story together, but emotionally focus on him. They were like, no, this is going to be a rocket story. More of the focus, as I said, on the best character who now happens to be the main character. So I was very satisfied with the experience. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things they do really well is that they are, it's the Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy. It's not the Star Lord trilogy. And yeah, like you said, he is the leader. He's probably the biggest name right now who you market behind. But they, you know, make an effort to really develop and get into all of these characters. And I think at every point in this trilogy, you can point to um, a moment where James Gunn took time to fully flesh out. And I think that's what makes this ending so perfect for th- this group because it's only three movies, which that's like an MC- I feel like the MCU has warped our I perception yeah. of how long franchises need to go for because a trilogy for like most of film history has been more than enough, if not overkill at times. Uh, so we've had plenty of times. I mean, six movies they've been in. So, like, yeah, it is bittersweet in the sense that, like, we do want more, but we've had plenty of time with these characters, and I think we they were able to fully realize these arcs in a way that I think few directors can manage. And I think going into DC, like, after this completed project, I have more faith. Not that I doubted James Gunn, but I do have more faith in him to really be able to have a wide scope and fully develop the DCEU in a functional way. But yeah, I think the decision to really focus on Rocket um, and get more into his character was, you know, a bit of a risky decision, but it paid off so well because in that story, you pretty much get all, like you said, like the darker moments, but you know, these heartfelt moments which makes it even more depressing uh when we finally get to the moment where we really see what makes rocket the character that he is like you said having animals and the abuse be a a center point of that story it's hard not to like i don't think anybody watches that movie and doesn't feel bad and i think that makes the high evolutionary that more despicable of a character and lends to having a great performance it's not a thanos situation where a lot of people point to the best villains being having gray or having some kind of moral dilemma where you can see where they're coming from even though if you don't agree with them no this guy is just a fucking asshole and you hate him and sometimes that works so well for a story yeah he was just a straight up sociopath and it gives uh the actor so and, and it gives an actor so much to play with from a performance standpoint where you're so animated uh you're boisterous at times you're you can be wise and a bit more tender because you're trying to emotionally manipulate people and then you're just totally unhinged cult leader pseudo wannabe god and it you know gives the guardians one last chance to show them to show themselves and show the audience how much 
they care about each other and how they've become a family of misfits, of, of disparate people coming together to form something that's not perfect, but it is their family. And that's sort of beautiful. And then with the, you know, like the heartfelt moments you mentioned with Rocket and his first family, you know, that theme, it, it, it is simple, but powerful. The, the idea of friendship and what it can do for a person, how it can make you feel more comfortable, just a simple word or a gesture in a situation that can be so horrible. And like I said, you know, to me, even though the Guardians are, you know, that's the selling point, the camaraderie, the group, the chemistry, but the villain was, ha- the villain happened to be the biggest standout of the film. And because we've seen with the Guardians, Guardians 1, like I said, one of my favorite movies, Ronan, not that great of a villain, but you didn't really need a great villain because the focus and what they, what he excelled at was the characters and their relationship. And... You know, I had some problems with too. I had some problems in this movie as well. But at the end of the day, for what makes these movies work is this group and their chemistry together. Right, yeah, and it gives the group something to unite around. They're trying to help their friend. And uh, as you said, you see what this character is doing. You're instantly going to hate him. Anybody who's torturing animals in this way, who's discarding them and manipulating them. So it is all about the family that they've created, that they've found uh, with, uh, with each other. It just sets it up perfectly for one last hurrah because the emotional stakes are so high. And uh, the flashbacks were handled so well, not giving us, you know, those full looks at the actual torture that was going down. Even the moment when they're reading through the memories, when Nebula is uh, projecting it, that was even hard to see when they're saying he he keeps squirming and he's crying. It just absolutely breaks your heart, dude. Uh, One moment that... It's almost hard to talk about it without tearing up, but when Rocket first gets his voice and the first thing he says is hurts, dude, I'm legit like almost tearing up thinking about it. And she dabs the napkin and taps his head. That was such a sweet and tender moment. So the development they did for those characters too, uh, you know, I saw some jackass on Twitter say there's a whole Disney Plus show full of content in those cages. Like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> These are the moments that they were able to show because the rest of it was horrifying. Yeah. But well, uh, I thought the voiceover performances were great. The innocence, the camaraderie, showing us that Rocket had a family before the Guardians. So we know why he's so afraid of commitment and attachment because he had his family ripped away from him. Mm-hmm. And I love the emphasis on the urgency from Quill, you know, calling him his best friend, saying, I need to save my best friend and Drax getting jealous. But he had complete tunnel vision on saving his friend, on saving his family member. And that's what most people would do when put in this position, willing to sacrifice everything, never second guessing, just totally focused on saving your friend. And it just hammers home how much these characters mean to each other and how much they mean to me because uh, I'm just getting chills thinking about it. You know, that just that desperation, that urgency to not lose somebody else, you know, of, n- of not wanting to lose someone you care about. But yeah, that villain, you know, the one line that stands out is when he told one of his underlings, there is no God. That's why I stepped in. Yeah, You're just a madman so who, as he says, wants to create the quote unquote perfect world. And the whole message of the Guardians movies has been since the beginning that nobody's perfect, but that's okay. It's about finding people who accept you for what you are and who understand you and help you become better versions of yourself. Where these characters started and where they end off, they, they've had such a positive impact on each other's lives. So it's sort of the, the perfect villain for this imperfect group of heroes to f- fight against. So I thought the themes and the messages there were... Is simple but profound, and that's the best way to do it with a movie like this, because we've known the Guardians to be a fun-loving group, so there's going to be humor and there's going to be action sequences. But James Gunn was able to, to balance all of that while going a bit darker, so that's what I found most impressive, that it was true to the Guardians, even if it was a, mm-hmm. a bit darker and a bit more mature. Yeah, I think at times this movie got a little too goofy, fell into some of the things that I didn't like about Volume 2, where I felt like, one, the humor was perfect in a lot of ways and placed in points where it made sense and never, I mean, it's a talking tree uh, and a raccoon, like, it's goofy in nature, but I feel like at times it goes a little bit too much onto that side. So, like, when they're going through the, I don't even know what to call it, the security thing and they need to get the information, I felt at times that was a little little bit too goofy, but, um, again, just minor criticisms. I, I thought some of the action sequences were some of the best that I've seen from the Guardians and maybe the MCU as a whole, especially that hallway scene. I thought that was just a shit ton of fun with the needle drop of Don't Sleep Till Brooklyn. Like, that's another thing he's just so good at is finding the right music to intertwine into his movies that just make 
the scene that much more epic or cooler. Yeah, that was a fun action sequence. Even the final shot of the movie, I thought, maybe was the best shot with Rocket leading that new group. And uh, you get that still where the arrows whizzing around and warlocks in the background. So that was awesome. I've kind of just accepted that Drax is a walking punchline mm-hmm. at this point, so I wasn't as thrown off by it as I was in Volume 2. I do feel like I need to go back and watch Volume 2, because people fucking love that movie, It's man. good. It's it's a lot of fun. Um, a lot of people think it's the best one. And I, thinking about it, Ego was a great villain, and uh, that really is a way that, you know, they had the Star-Lord and Gamora stuff in this one, but for Peter's full arc, you know, it does come, uh, you know, to a nice end at the end of 3, but... That's he's more of the focus in two, so I guess that's why you know it opened up the avenue to focus more on Rocket. But I feel like that's a movie I have to revisit. But for the most part, I enjoyed the humor. I enjoyed the relationship between Mantis and Drax. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just find them funny. The back and forth, uh, the little nudging that they do. They're so innocent, so pure with each other. And I also like the uh, the idea of quote unquote higher intelligence not being the only type of intelligence that there's emotional intelligence that you see it with Drax where he's able to communicate with the children because mm-hmm. he can get on their wavelength whereas Nebula and Mantis struggle with that. So classic don't judge a book by its cover. And the same thing with Rocket where he sees at the end the raccoons that were there that were waiting to be experimented on and he sees the value in those quote-unquote lower life forms. Just because you're conscious, just because you're self-aware doesn't mean that, you know, you're someone... Or just because you're not conscious or not self-aware doesn't mean that you deserve to be tortured and experimented on for the benefit of higher life forms. So those themes really do shine through. I'm trying to think of things... There's really not much I didn't like about it. I just thought, you know, it was really solid. I don't know if I would put it above one. I think I definitely enjoyed it more than two. Even the addition of Adam Warlock, you're thinking, how are they going to use this character? Is he going to stay a villain throughout? Because he shows up and he just fucking wrecks shop. Yeah. <laughs> He's just fucking them up. And it's uh, somebody commented on this on t- uh, about this on Twitter. It's the perfect way to use a Superman-type character in a story where th- the characters aren't so overpowered. They're superheroes, but they're not gods. So he shows up, he wrecks shop, and, you know, he really gets the ball rolling for what the story is going to be. But even his mini arc, you know, coming to terms with his existence as this superpowered being and realizing I I don't want to be used as a soldier or as a weapon. I want to be a part of a family, too. And I thought Will Poulter was solid. He was solid. I think they could have. There was a little bit more they could have done with that, or kind he of. He was very goofy. Just leave it out, <laughs> right? Um, entirely. But uh, at the end of the day, I, yeah, I did appreciate some of those moments. But um, R.I.P. Elizabeth Debicki. Yeah. Yo, when he had to get on the step stool, that was so fucking funny, man. <laughs> She's tall, dude. Yeah. No, it's a baseball team. <laughs> Hey, man, she could pitch. She's playing, yeah, with, she the playing with the wrong guardians. She could be a relief pitcher. Are you kidding me? Randy Johnson coming um, out of the pen. Coming out to the guardians theme. <laughs> Underrated theme. I wish they used it more. Uh, I was also upset. No Star-Lord mask. I know James Gunn hates the mask for some reason, but that's my favorite part about Star-Lord. Yeah, I do love that mask, and I noticed that as well, that he never puts on the mask. Well, it was funny to see James Gunn voice his frustrations through the script about them killing off Gamora. Yeah. Because he's been very open about that. It's, um... Yeah, I think if you asked him and if he could do it himself, like, he wouldn't have to navigate through that at all. But in a weird way, it was, like, kind of interesting to explore somebody that... um, Because if she never died, I assume, you know, for the most part, it would kind of just be her and Star-Lord's relationship kind of continuing to grow and uh, maybe change slightly, but having to navigate through that and then kind of completely flip that on its head where, you know, Star-Lord is so, you know, still dealing with losing Gamora. And you imagine that happening, losing, you know, the love of your life, but then having her come back and it's just not her. Yeah, it's That's, fucked up. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to tackle. But in having to go through that grief process and deal with all that and then having it in front of you but realizing that this is a different person and I got to respect. Uh, well, like, technically he didn't even lose her for that long. Well, I guess he did from the time of coming back in Endgame and then having to discover her. Yeah. But it really was just like a snapshot, right? Cause he loses Gamora and then he fucking dies. But yeah, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. I'm getting yeah. sweaty. But then her like having to, it's weird because like we know where she ends up in her development and who she is to her core, but different circumstances, the butterfly effect just brings you somewhere else. And seeing her appreciate the Guardians, but realizing this new life I have with the Ravagers, like, this is my family now. And maybe in another life, this I could see myself here, but 
that's just not the way it worked out for me. Yeah, it was very bittersweet. You had the sci-fi mumbo jumbo trying to wrap your head around the concept of a person from an alternate reality, how they are the same person, but they're not. But I think the the real life parallels of people growing apart, people coming to the mature decision that maybe we don't love each other anymore, but we can still be on good terms. Mm-hmm. And I can uh, love you from afar. I can appreciate what you've built and what you're striving to do. Because Quill, as sweet as the relationship was with Gamora, he's got a lot of baggage. And I think he, you know, he comes to realize that in the end, that he's been running away from home for the longest time and he decides to go back. So it was also cool to see a different side of Gamora. Gamora pre-joining the Guardians before she has this moral awakening that I need to stop Thanos. You see the brutality of that character. She was, you know, she's quick to snap, very irritable, uh, very formidable when fighting. So uh, I think that's fun for Zaldana because I think sometimes when it's a group of four or five dudes and one woman, the woman character always gets relegated to the mother, the responsible Mm -hmm. one, the grown-up. So to see her a bit more reckless, a bit more unhinged was fun. Yeah, And I think it, it looked like Zaldana had a fun time playing her. She also just, once again, I'm such a dog, but she just looked even hotter. It was like the hottest Gamora's look, that hair. I was like, yeah, you go, girl. That's the glow up, right? Yeah. Break up. Well, she didn't have to go through all the Thanos nonsense. No, she didn't go through the Thanos. No, they wiped that off the map for her. She didn't yeah. even get that chance to. Stress free. But it was, uh, you know, when she says the woman you're describing sounds more like Nebula. You know, Nebula is someone who in the first movie, I, I remember you didn't like her much. It's not so memorable. Mm-hmm. She's just their evil robot villain. But I think as far as she's come to now that she's as important to the Guardians as Gamora was. It's really cool to see the way that that uh, the way that Gunn was able to write her from villain to now hero, and it's something that Karen Gillan's performance, I think, in those moments, it's like she never thought that she would be in a position like this. That her whole life was going to be lackey for genocidal maniac, mm-hmm. but she's actually a part of a family. So that was sweet. That was heartwarming. Yeah, and even with Peter, I mean, I think he's he's up there. He's one of my favorite. Uh, comic book characters now and Chris Pratt has just played him wonderfully throughout every every time he's Star-Lord on screen just that perfect blend of like goofiness charisma cool and just yeah I think that's like a character he's really like born to play it's funny when this first came out the talk was Chris Pratt's the new Harrison Ford. And I think with the other projects that he's done, the big budgeted projects, they just don't understand him like James Gunn does. Right. So in Jurassic Park, he doesn't have that same personality. He's just cool guy. But here, like you said, there's more vulnerability to him and insecurity. And they tackled that a bit with his alcohol problems. So even though he does have that charm and that charisma, he's not afraid to get in the mud. And it's similar with Dave Bautista. I think that's why he's really succeeded in the other roles that he's taken. But yeah, he continues to be just the perfect leading man. And as I said, going back to the casting, perfect choice to play Star Lord. <laughs> I got I was laughing so hard, dude, when he kept saying that it's not a trap, it's a it's a face off. <laughs> <laughs> he was just he kept doubling, tripling down on that. And that was awesome too, dude, when Groot was hiding all the gats. Yeah. I like this um young adult Groot or maybe early 20s Groot, millennial Groot. I don't know. <laughs> Gen Z Groot. I don't know how Groot ages. That motherfucker's brolic. Yeah. He was he was a big boy in this one. <laughs> it was so cool when Star-Lord and Groot walked in on slow motion on the villain. But that was also so satisfying, the moment where Rock- Rocket Raccoon embraces his name mm. and tells him, yeah, I'm Rocket Raccoon, motherfucker. And even the moment when they're all picking their names. You know, you have the, the walrus who says Teefs, and it's cute, it's innocent. The bunny says Floor, right? Uh, We know which experiments didn't really work too well intellectually. (laughs) Come on, man. (laughs) They got fucking murdered. You you, you take shots at their intelligence? Jesus Christ. Let them rest in peace. Well, I think Rocket and Layla are just... No, they were kind of like... They were talking shit about them in private. (laughs) It was fucking Did he say teeth? Are you going to call them that? (laughs) It's not even... The vocabulary isn't even right. Bad grammar. (laughs) But that was a moment that, once again, there are a lot of emotional moments in this movie, but that was awesome. Yeah, For just them, their, wonder, their independence, right. is, you know, that we're not going to, you know, just stay victims. We're going to attempt to get out of here. And that starts by giving ourselves names. And that was a moment that, like I said, it, it was just awesome to see the origins of that name because it, all his friends knew, like, this motherfucker picked the cool name. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, can we do that again? <laughs> I didn't know we could pick cool names. Uh, I'm a machine gun. I'm a machine yeah, gun. Yeah, yeah. 
I'm rocket ship. Yeah. Man, fuck you. Yeah, I mean, their wonder they had, like, talking about the sky and getting out and what they're going to do when they finally uh, are able to live in paradise and things of like that it makes it even more heartbreaking. But in the moments, I think it was definitely, it was nice to see them kind of be so hopeful, even though, um, you know, audience probably saw it coming. But when it's confirmed to Rocket that, yeah, they're going right to the incinerator, uh, it's definitely a sad moment. Oh, dude, it's such a sad moment, especially when uh, Lila, that was her name, right, Lila? Mm-hmm. When she was shot. And the high evolutionary, he pissed me off a few times in this movie. But when he was mocking the way that Rocket was crying, I was like, somebody needs to put this motherfucker so, down. Someone needs to rip his face off. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. Yeah, ripped yeah, his yeah. face off. And the prosthetics were awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I was just so ready for that motherfucker to be taken out. <laughs> Um, what else was I thinking about? Oh, Counter Earth, that was funny as well. When he, you know, his whole aspirations of building the perfect being to live in the perfect society, and when the Star Lord says, you know, does the perfect society in- include an octopus selling meth to people? And the High Evolutionary's like, probably not. <laughs> It's like, no, I, I see that there are some errors in my ways. But uh, once again, the moment for Rocket realizing that he is the main character of the story, that he was able to do what the high evolutionary could not because that was inherent to him. It wasn't something that was given to him. That's who he is. He is the super genius. So all those moments were so great for a character who, to me, is one of the best characters in the MCU since that first 2014 movie. And Bradley Cooper, such an underrated voiceover performance. You close your eyes and you can't picture Bradley Cooper in that role, and that's the mark of a great voiceover performance. You know, now going on five movies he's always delivered he's always been so funny so sardonic uh sarcastic he had the best the funniest line in infinity war i still think when he's um he goes, oh, dead. <laughs> dead dad huh that could be <laughs> what is this <laughs> he goes uh dead bro- so uh, uh dead brother huh yeah that could be annoying <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's so great because he's like all right time to time to be the captain <laughs> That's the first thing he says to him. It also pisses me off that this is meaningless, but James Gunn saying that Rocket and Thor don't keep in touch. He really hates what they did to him with those Guardians movies. Taika wanted nothing to do with it. James Gunn wanted nothing to do with it. I thought it could have been fun to see Thor and the Guardians running around, but... I think it was fun for Infinity War. Yeah, it was. But the fact that Gunn has to come out and say they don't keep in touch, like, gee, come on. They bonded. They went through stuff, man. They had the moment in Infinity War. He's on his shoulder. Yeah. Come on. They text. They did. Yeah, even... Fuck that. Go go to DC. Do it, Batman. <laughs> well, based on what he did with Adam Warlock, I, I'm confident in... I mean, I've always been confident in what he can do with Superman, but he, James Gunn has a lot of heart, and sometimes those messages rub each other the wrong way because he's like, oh, we need to accept all life forms and... You know, everybody deserves empathy and sympathy, but then <laughs> the next scene, they'll just be killing all these other animals who are also tortured and <laughs> manipulated by this guy. And it's just like, yay, violence. So yeah. he likes the sweetness and he likes the madness. And sometimes they rub each other the wrong way. But for the most part, I think he balances them well. Well, I think about a Warlock, I think some of the moments of his uh, emotional immaturity uh, that's another instance of it being a little too goofy at times, but towards the end when he does realize that like he has a power and he's going to control what he does and ultimately decides that he wants to help, um, I think that's a theme you can, I mean, very much, uh, you can very much bring over to like a Superman character. Oh yeah, without a doubt, dude. And I, w- I do wonder later in the MCU, this has me excited about the future, fuck, I'm back on the MCU train, if he will become more like Adam Warlock in the comics where he just super wise he's like a super powered buddha yeah adam warlock kind of takes an interesting turn where he is this kind of very neutral character right where he has a good side and he has a bad side um yeah i do wonder what the future holds and um skipping to the end quick um you know there is this new guardians group so i don't know maybe it can be you know this iteration of the guardians is over but they could go forward with this group. Obviously, Batista, I think, is pretty much done. But there is a thing at the the second end credits, Star-Lord will return. So what, Right. In what Interesting capacity? choice there to say Star-Lord's coming back, but yeah. not necessarily the Guardians. I think that we could see the Guardians show up from time to time. Or if they do come back as a team, it will be a, in a Rocket and Groot movie. Well, Adam I, Warlock was definitely going to return. Right, yeah. But with Star-Lord returning and him now being on Earth, and that was also a sweet moment with him and his grandfather, I I wonder in what capacity they're going to use him. Maybe he joins the Avengers. I think that would 
that could be interesting. You know, he led the Guardians, and the Avengers are lacking in leadership. There's a few candidates there. You, you'd naturally think Cap, mm-hmm. new Cap. But, like, without his boots and his mask, what does he do? Oh, he definitely has his boots and his mask. <laughs> you, you think he left behind the gear? Like, he retired? He did not use the mask once. Then he used the flying boots once. Well, he didn't once. need it when he got to Earth. He just used his blasters. No, he just had the blasters, right? Well, he, I guess in... The action sequences, he didn't really need the mask. He's not part God anymore. Well, you know, once James Gunn is out of the picture, they're going to give him back that fucking mask. Yeah. (laughs) They love that bullshit, the nanotech. Yeah, and you're a God again. Yeah, and you also have God. Yeah. Don't ask why, but And don't tell James. Pretty please. Yeah, I think Drax, you know, I I think down the line, they knock on the door like, hey, you want $5 million to cameo in this movie? Yeah, Secret Wars, I'm sure. There's going to be something. They're definitely on the sidelines for now, which is fine. And I, I truly, I don't know what Marvel is going to do if they will eventually do Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 4 without James Gunn. I hope they don't. I don't want that. Because they're so synonymous now. I think the style is perfect. When people talk about what other writers and directors could tackle um, the Guardians, I'm like, I, I don't want to see it, dude. I know that he didn't create these characters, but this iteration is, is very much his. So he's just as important to the team as any of these other actors it's something that I wouldn't want to see, but I'm satisfied with where they left all these characters. I don't think that you know, we're definitely going to see Rocket and Groot again yeah. in some capacity. But even seeing like Star Lord, or if we do see Rocket and Groot, like just the style and humor and the way these characters act, it's hard to see somebody else tackling that 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 that's not James Gunn. Imagine someone trying to replicate like a needle drop during a big sequence with Star Lord, and it's just something just feels off. What up, blood? What up, cuz? Yeah, I wonder what music he's going to get into now. <laughs> yeah, and also, that's one of the funniest, like, small little jokes of these movies that he has a Zune. Yeah. It's so fucking perfect. I love that Rocket's always stealing it from him. That was perfect uh, opening song, acoustic cover of Creep. Yeah, the needle drops. He's never going to hit those highs of the first one because they just fit so perfectly in the story, dude. I think Rubber Band Man's one of my favorite in Infinity yeah, War. Yeah, right. But the Pina Colada song when he's flying out after stealing back the orb yeah. is so perfect, dude. He looks so cool in the mask and his hair's blowing in the wind. Drax is like, behold. Perfect. Um, and I love the reference to Come and Get Your Love there at the end. Another one of my favorite needle drops of that first movie. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we missed. You know, Palm Clementeeth, I think she's underrated as Mantis, yeah. dude. She's really become sort of like the heart of the team stepping into that Gamora role where she's the adult but she is also goofy Mm -hmm. and funny and a little silly at times and like I said she's got her back and forth rivalry with Drax when she (laughs) manipulated the guy into being in love with him I thought that was funny I thought I think one of the funniest small parts too at the end when she's like yeah it's time for me to be on my own explore see what I want Drax is like great I'm coming with you I'll come with you like no Drax <laughs> Drax you yeah, you stay here your contract is over but I think the way they all wrapped up like it was very well done Star-Lord going home kind of regaining everything that he was that was stolen from him Gamora finding her her place in this world post Thanos Nebula and Drax kind of taking it upon themselves to be leaders to this growing uh, civilization on nowhere um for nebula it's something where she's so used to destroying being a part of something that can create um i think that's a good arc for her and drax we heard like obviously their first introduction is to him is his family was taken and he was so bloodthirsty for revenge but you know kind of starting a new family in a sense maybe mantis uh, you know i think that's a nice sentiment her Basically, like Star Lord being robbed of most of her life and her upbringing by ego and having that taken away from her. That is something that they did bring, they introduced in the holiday special that was never really, um, that was just brought up in this movie. So I think, and, and all the stuff on Nowhere. Yeah, so people ho- who didn't watch the holiday special yeah. were like, what? <laughs> and, the, and the stuff on Nowhere, you know, a lot of that was kind of leading into this movie as well. So a lot of connections there. So yeah, I think they all had like a, a nice rap. And yeah, you know, like Rocket being the leader now and of the Guardians, him basically being able to defeat his demons of his upbringing. There's a lot of that. I do wonder, because it seems like in this universe... Oh, stop shaking the... Yeah. Tail. <laughs> it seems like in this universe, the battle and Endgame and everything that happened in Infinity War and Endgame was like live streamed. 
They're like, <laughs> we stuff we see in a Spider-Man movies, like they know every little detail about it. No one knows about the Guardians of the Galaxy, especially on Earth. The holiday special, Kevin Bacon had no idea who these people were. Um, Star Lord's grandpa, like when he when he saw him, he was like, "Holy shit, Peter, you're alive!" Didn't say that, but it was all in his face. It's like. I feel like they would be bigger deals. Yeah, that's one of those things that it, it doesn't make sense that people know the specifics of the battle and they're so familiar with all these other heroes. But for some reason, the Guardians, they go under the radar. And it's sort of the way that the connected universe clashes with these personal visions because I think it makes more sense, even though it doesn't make sense, that the Guardians wouldn't be well known. It keeps them cosmic and sort of exotic. They're more mysterious than your neighborhood superheroes but yeah no it totally doesn't make sense whatsoever they're famous out in the universe people really know them do they (laughs) they've got that remember uh yondu's like we can't kill the guardians of the galaxy everybody's gonna be pissed oh yeah sure but no i think i think you hit the nail on the head the the way that he ended it but left these stories open it it feels like a true ending for the guardians team as we know it but there's some potential for future arcs and These characters, for the most part, deserve to rest for a little bit, but I think we will see them in in the future. And I am very happy no one died. A lot of times... Dude, I I thought Rocket was going to die that entire fucking movie. I I thought Drax and Rocket were fucking goners, just from everything leading up to the movie. Well, when Drax... I thought they were going to kill Drax in the corporation when they started clapping back at them, when he got shot in, like, the chest. I was like, oh, here it is. This is (laughs) sad. He's just going to die in the middle of the movie. And I think that sometimes can derail some things when it comes to, like, stakes and all that, but... Yeah, but you also, like, I didn't need Drax yeah. to die. I think sometimes movies do that where it's like... Where it's we, unnecessary. Right, yeah. It's I'm happy that Drax gets a happy ending and he gets to be a stepfather for all those little super kids. And same thing with Rocket. You know, when I knew that she was going to stop him from walking, but he gets the moment where he gets to reunite with his friends in the little vision world of heaven. I love that fucking raccoon, man. He's right up there with Cap and Thanos for me as my favorite characters that they've done. It's a big three. It, he's just so fucking funny, man. <laughs> it just gets such a kick out of him. Uh, my, one of my favorite moments in the MCU is when he's ranting in the first one when they're at the bar. And um, the collector's, one of his uh, assistants opens the elevator. And as soon as she speaks, Rocket turns around and puts his gun on her. <laughs> it's like the collector would like to, He's like, dude was just ready to go at any moment. Yeah. What else? No, Cosmo. You didn't like Cosmo. <laughs> Come on. Don't put that on. You me. said she was a bad dog. <laughs> Bad girl. I was just joking. No, I, I loved Cosmo. Uh, voiced by Borat's daughter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same actress that voiced her in the holiday special. So another edition where it's just Cosmo. And we saw Cosmo in Guardians 1 when she growls at Rocket. <laughs> that was funny. You know, she was cute. And uh, she helped out when they saved all the animals. And once again, a movie that, you know, normally you save all the humans and that's it, right? And they, no, we're going to save all these fucking animals, even the big scary ones. (laughs) That was funny. Yeah. And they just come plopping out. Yeah, (laughs) roly polies. So it was a nice sentiment. And I think PETA has called this the most pro-animal movie ever made. (laughs) Have they? Yeah. Shout out PETA. All right, well, let's move on to U.S. Weekend Box Office. No surprise, it was Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, number one with $62 million. That ups its domestic total to $214 million. It is the best second week decline in the MCU's history, only a 49% decline. Comparing it to recent releases, Ant-Man and the Wasp, 70%, Thor Love and Thunder, 68%, Doctor Strange, 67 So it's about a 20-point percentage difference. Yeah, I think so it's it, very impressive. It's definitely, I think, some hesitation maybe for some people with the MCU of late. They're, you know, haven't had the momentum that they usually carry over from mil- movie to movie. And I think the critic scores, Rotten Tomatoes reactions, um, they weren't bad, but they weren't as positive as I think I was expecting or going into it, or you see with some of the top tier, but. Uh, we saw once it got released to audiences that opening weekend, just the outpouring of uh, love from fans. And I think that really resonated to people who were maybe waiting on it a little or maybe even waiting for it to come out on streaming to go out and go see it in the theater. And I think it's a movie that um, will get a lot of people back into the theater. I want to see it again already. So Yeah, I went to go see Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret today. And I was like... Should I just go see Guardians instead? (laughs) But I didn't have enough time. It's definitely a movie that if I'm at a movie, 
and I go to the bathroom, I'll probably walk in and just like watch for a little. <laughs> yeah, worldwide, it's up to 531 million. So we'll see if he can join the Billion Club. But it's got a chance to outgross Guardians 2, which I think was a touch under 900. And the first one was a touch under 8. So we will see. Uh, number two was the Super Mario Brothers movie. Made another 12 million. Its domestic total is now 535. And worldwide, it's up to $1.2 billion. Number three was Book Club, the next chapter. That made 6.6. Domestically, it's at 6.6. Worldwide, it's at 9.8 off of a $20 million budget. So we'll see if Diane Keaton and Jane Fonda can break even. I hope they do. I I like when the old vets get their uh, vacation in in Italy. I was looking up. I was like, was this actually shot in Italy? Yes, it was. So get a nice little paycheck, get to go to Venice, and uh, yeah, hang out with the girls. Evil Dead Rise came in at number four with 3.7. Domestically, it's up to 16. Worldwide, it's up to 131 million off of a $19 million budget. Happy so, Mother's Day to the mom in that movie. Happy Mother's Day to both of them, yeah. <laughs> All the memes about how they would let the mom rip them apart. People are just criminally horny, self inflicting. I mean, I've horniness. been on her since the trailer. I haven't heard you mention her once. In my mind. All, all you did was complain about her wasting eggs. <laughs> There's a lot of eggs in those. There's a lot of shells in those eggs. That was very annoying, actually. Uh, number five, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, movie that I just saw. Came in at number five with 2.5 million. Domestically, it's up to 16.5. And that is pretty much its worldwide total. Very cute coming of age. Rachel McAdams is in it. So, And Benny Safdie plays the father. So he pops up in different roles. He seems to enjoy yeah. acting. Could be an Oppenheimer. Right, yeah. So uh, I definitely recommend going to check this out. And good performances. I'm not sure who the actress who plays Margaret, but I think it was her first movie, and she was fantastic. It's always so impressive when first-time performers can be that good. It's like, why aren't more kids good actors? <laughs> who played God? I, you know what? I think that actually, um, well, Gilbert Godfrey, actually. Oh, okay, but yeah. it, it wasn't actually him. It was an AI. <laughs> so you don't have a Gilbert in the... Uh, no. I think Nash does. He sounds like him normally. That's mean. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good movie. Well, I mean, Mario's still fucking running strong. Chris Pratt running the box office so far this year. Um, oh, my God. Yeah, double Chris Pratt there at the top. I think Guardians... Yeah, let's see. Uh, I'm interested to see like the percentages and the declines over the next few weeks. I don't know what else is coming out. This is fast yeah yeah, yeah okay. you know what's coming out sorry guardians you want to see that on friday yeah i'm going at 6 20 let's do it i haven't doing s- a standard showing oh you haven't seen nine right but like you i can don't skip it yeah john cena is his brother they fight he comes over to the team he's part of the squad <laughs> i actually went to the theaters for nine and watched 20 minutes and just i was like oh, i'm leaving weren't you sick though no, I was, I was making a TikTok. Oh, right. yo, you i mean come on man you're in the theaters i know but it was like such you a turned your back on family and, yeah I was like, yeah, I'm not into this right now. Did you hear the news that it's not going to be a two-part? (laughs) Three-parter. I fucking love Vin Diesel so much. I wish I could shake his hand. Well, The Rock's back. That should be a big story. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. The Rock's... (laughs) All the memes so obvious. You know, Walter White telling Saul, we're not done till till I say we're done. (laughs) Yo, The Rock is so funny, man. He saw all his flops and said... Run it back. I'm going to work with those candy asses, as he called them. The Diesel wins again, man. He, I don't know, like, he brought back Brittany Griner, he brought back The Rock. <laughs> like, what can't this man do? What, I was going to say, he's what Groot. problems do we have? Yeah, he's Groot. He spoke. Yeah, he spoke, yeah. I love you guys. That was funny when Gamora was like, you guys just make up, you guys don't understand him, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Fast X. We'll see, man. I mean, I'm not sure what Fast 9 made. I don't know if it even made a, a billion. That was still COVID days, I think. Yeah, it was. 726, okay, so yeah. not terrible. Save the movie industry. I am so excited Diesel, for that fucking man. movie, dude. I, I, the threat of people saying, like, when did Fast lose touch with reality? Or when did Fast the Fast franchise abandon yeah. reality? And it's just all these clips of the most incredible action sequences <laughs> ever and people complaining. This is when I stopped watching. I was like, that's when you stopped? It's like, look at this incredibly well shot practical action sequence. The one when he drives off the cliff and the thing latches to the car and whips around. <laughs> that, I think to me that's more ridiculous than going to space. Because like at least in like when you go into space. Bro, when he caught that car, he straight up catches a car. Yeah, but like 
the thing about going into space, it's like you run the numbers, you can be like, okay, this is a plan. Like we're going to space. And it, right, it is right. ridiculous to bring a car into space, but like sure. at least there's some semblance of like, okay, like let's let's get the science behind it. Let, let's uh let's run the numbers. That move, that split decision, split second decision to see that post with the wire and be like, oh, if I hit it at this angle, it's going to wrap around the wheel and wick me around here. <laughs> there's just no pot. There's no, no way. No, no, The physics don't add up. It's like with Cap and he does Shield. it with such confidence, too. No, no. Not a doubt in his mind. You think the diesel has time for doubt? <laughs> the only thing that man is thinking is fuel and family. The two Fs of life. If he had balls, he would have one of those moments and he just fucking dies. That would be hilarious, mm-hmm. dude, if one time one of these characters just... Well, I mean, they've literally brought back people who have blown up in car crashes. Han, Gail Gadot's going to be in this next one. She straight up just... <laughs> she was dropped off of an airplane and got, like, ran over by a car. She's fine. That's why I love this franchise so much, dude. They're so fucking stupid. <laughs> Well, I mean, they talk about, like, oh, everyone's in a Marvel movie. I mean, they have everybody. Momoa, Brie Larson, Gal Gadot. Yeah, the Brie Rock. Larson's going to be in this. Yeah. Charlize Theron. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a fun Friday night. Shout out to Ludacris also. That's a slushy movie. Luda! Yeah, baby! <laughs> yeah. Woo! Back again! Luda! His early 2000s run so underrated. Perfect voice for a hook. Yeah. All right, well, last story here. The Cannes Film Festival taking place in the south of France is underway. So there are some key films streaming at, uh, well, screening. Screening. Oh, boy. (laughs) I'm going to have John Luke Dard's ghost is going to haunt me. (laughs) Well, actually, his last movie, it's a short film, 20 minutes long, trailer of a film that will never exist. Phony Wars. Perfect final movie for Godard, as pretentious as ever until the very end. So I'm, I'm sure people who are there uh, getting to watch that for the first time are really excited. But we also have Martin Scorsese's Killer of the Flower Moon, Killers of the Flower Moon, which is, uh, I think, screening in a couple of days. I almost said streaming again. That is actually not in competition for the Palm d'Or. So I guess he wants to give everybody else a chance because I've heard the movie's incredible based on people who have already seen it. And uh, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny is also screening. I'm interested in that one. Um, Indiana? Yeah. Because I think it's been a while and it's such a popular franchise and, um, you know, those first couple of movies are just so iconic for a lot of people. And to have someone... Oof, I just got like a... That's Godard. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, He's getting confused. He doesn't know who said it. Uh, to, to have a director like... Um, he smelled the cigarettes on yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, what's his name? Mad Max. Ford versus George Ferrari. Miller. Yeah, George Miller. To have someone like George Miller come in and... Oh, you mean James Mangold. James Mangold. Why can't I... Why do I get them confused? <laughs> you just tried to give George Miller Ford versus Ferrari. I did. Yeah. That'd be sick. And just cars. Yeah. Yeah, James Mangold, Logan Ford versus Ferrari, Indiana Jones. Could be a fucking sick run. Yeah, definitely. I've heard good things about this from people who have seen it, too. Um... But yeah, just to see him tackle this project, I think he's, uh, you know, really like I just like I said with Logan, with Ford versus Ferrari, having a nice streak of just fun action movies that are also, you know, emotional and gripping in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, people were shitting on that first clip that dropped, and it's funny because whenever I see that sequence, it's the car chase in the trailer. I don't know if the movie is going to be good or bad, but we we really take Spielberg for granted because he's clearly trying to do a Spielberg. And nobody moves the camera like that boy, SS. Yeah, I mean, it's something where... I mean, it's natural to compare them, right? I right. mean, come on, he did the first three. We're so far removed from it at this point. First and, four. And I think um, it's uh, it's something where I think we knew this was coming, where they were going to do the Harrison Ford passing the mantle on, and it looks like it's going to be Phoebe Wallabridge playing his gone daughter, who I enjoy a lot. And I think it seems like Harrison Ford is, like, bringing it. From what I've seen in the trailer, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah, no, it feels like he cares. I feel like he cares about Indiana Jones 20 times more than he did about Han Solo. Oh, yeah. Well, he brought it for Force Awakens, which was awesome, because he could have phoned that in. But he seemed to, even on the press tour, he was enjoying himself. I think he he enjoys playing Han Solo. He doesn't enjoy the attention mm-hmm. that it gets, because Indiana Jones is a bit different. It's, it's for everybody. With Star Wars, there's a very specific and very passionate group of fans that can get a bit too sweaty you know indiana jones you're not going to go up to him and ask him all these nerd questions you're just gonna be like can you do the whip yeah i'd be like 
are you kidding me? I could do the whip. And so, the, yeah, the Nazis are back. Like those fucking Nazis, man. They just don't give up. No, I mean we're seeing it in, in the real world. <laughs> yeah, um, they're persistent. So yeah, I don't think I'm. I was never the biggest indie fan, but something about this, I think I'm hoping it like it, it, it's back. You know, I think that would be cool. Yeah, and some of the other movies that are competing are Club Zero from Jessica Hausner, La Camera from Alice Rohrwacher, Last Summer from Catherine Berlot, I think that's how you say her name, and Justine Treats Anatomy of a Fall. So those are some of the movies that people are keeping an eye on. Also, we have Todd Haynes's new film, May December, starring Julianne Moore and Natalie Portman. That sounds like it could be really good. And the director of Under the Skin, first movie in 10 years, The Zone of Interest. So that's Jonathan Glazer. It's going to be a lot of attention on that movie. Under the Skin, often considered one of the best movies of the last decade. We had a fun back and forth of me letting you borrow the DVD, you taking forever to watch it, but you finally watched it. And Do I still have that? I don't know. I'll have to check my collection. I I you might, yeah. It. No, yeah, I like it. I'm going to need that back. Yeah. Um, Motherfuckers yeah, passing it around. I think, uh, you know, once festival season kind of kicks off it's always interesting to, it's fun to see and hearing the first reactions obviously the bigger name the movies are always going to have the most eyeballs on it whether it be killers of the flower moon or dune a little bit down the road it's asteroid it's, city yeah premiering a con wes anderson so <laughs> that trailer is so funny dude when he's like you're a widower and he's like yeah don't tell my kids though <laughs> <laughs> Um, but a lot of the times it is these not smaller movies, but not the names that pop out right away that really begin their uh, run towards potential award season or getting that word of mouth. So when they do come out, people are anticipating them. You know, I don't know how many times like the past few years going to like even Toronto is a little bit later on, so you have a sense of some movies. But even then, in September, there are a lot of movies that are just kind of you're hearing about, like that you didn't even know were coming out that come Oscar season, they're right there for nominations. So it always is fun to get that first word of mouth. Obviously, Killers of the Flower Moon is going to be the most talked about coming out of it. And that first tweet I see, that Scorsese did it again. I'm going to get so fucking excited. There was a tweet, the, there was a. Um it wasn't a press screening. It was a mixture of filmmakers, critics, sort of a, if you're in the know screening. Yeah. And the reactions from that were, Scorsese did it again. I mean, the comments, did you see that, the interview that he gave at Khan when he talked about how he feels like the potential of cinema is really yeah. opening up for him? You hear that from artists all the time. Also, it was the first 40X movie. <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah, he finally watched Fast, yeah. the Fast franchise. He, he saw Paul Walker say, forget about it, Khan. And he's like... <laughs> kaleidoscope eyes i get it now but you always hear it dude musicians painters where they reach a certain stage and they're like wait a minute i, I get it now i i want to really try this i want to do this and you know more score i think he is 80 now yeah but it's amazing i remember tarantino had those comments a few years back that directors get worse with age but he's flying in the face of that because his pre his last few movies have been incredible seems like he's only getting better he's definitely has a he's playing just like He's feeling himself at this, what, three hours and 29 minutes? He's like, I, I can do this. And yeah. no one's going to care. Um, I bet that shit is going to be incredible. The standing ovation <laughs> is going to be obnoxiously long. Yeah. Good or bad, it's going to be one of those ones oh, where yeah, you see yeah. 17 minutes and you're like, no movie deserves a 17-minute standing ovation. I always, Whenever I'm at a movie that uh, people are going to clap at the end of, uh, I always like keep track of time. I'm like, there's no way motherfuckers be going for 15, 20 minutes at these festivals. I think the longest I've been... I, I guess if he's there, like if he was there, I would want to participate in that. Well, yeah. I it's think like an appreciation. When we know? saw uh, Worst Person in the World, I think that's a long longest standing ovation I've been a part of because you had the initial standing ovation and then the cast came out on the balcony and then there's a an additional I think that was like a good four minute five minute ovation. no yeah it was it was and that deserves some of the numbers you, you see at con well be that like a, movie had be like that, 12 minutes that's the best feeling dude when you're at these festivals well, I've only been to one in person but when it's a great movie because you're in a crowd of film lovers you know and when it could really just hold the audience's attention, everybody's laughing, everybody's really into it. It was such a great feeling to experience that a few times uh, at TIFF and that one time at the New York Film Festival. Yeah, it's fun because usually the press screenings are, you don't really get that. Uh, but the ones where they allow the general admission, those are the right. fun, those are the ones you, uh, you got to be at. Yeah. Yeah. And a couple of directors going for their second Palm d'Or uh, Hir Hirokazu Korida with Monster. 
uh, Nuri Kalin about dry grasses, Nani Moretti with A Brighter Tomorrow, Wim Wenders, Perfect Days. So, And Ken Loach has a trance at winning, the, uh, winning his third Palm d'Or, which would be the first time in history that's ever happened, but uh, history tells us that's not going to happen, but... His new movie is called The Old Oak. So we've got some some newer filmmakers, some returning legends. Corita has been one of my fa- favorite filmmakers of the last few years. His movie last year, Broker, starring the dad from Parasite, was incredible. Final scene that rips me apart whenever I think about it. But yeah, that's fun. Khan is underway. So for all of our super big film lovers, keep an eye on Khan. Yeah. I think Past Lives is coming out soon. Are you going to go see that? You know what, dude? I am gonna go see it, but I just know it's gonna rip me apart. <laughs> it's not. It's I'm, just all the sh- like the shot when they're holding the pole and they're almost touching, and the the yearning and the longing. I'm like, oh, it's sweet. It does look very yeah, sweet. No, but I'm just even getting chills thinking about it. There's a lot of funny moments, but yeah, I mean, it goes, it goes to, like it's. I think it's very authentic in a lot of ways. <laughs> it, it seems brutal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to feel these feelings. I don't, I, it comes out I, soon, right? Yeah, it does. Yeah, I think you'll really like it. Well, I saw the trailer for it, and then I saw on Letterboxd that you had logged in. I was yeah. like, oh, I guess this was at uh, one of the festivals. But people seem to really love that movie. Yeah, movie of the year talk. Uh, for me, it is. I mean, obviously, it's still early, but I think it's my favorite so far. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good one. All right, yeah, we're going to wrap it up there. Didn't take any fan questions because I knew we were going to be reviewing Guardians, and that was going to take up a lot of our time. And I also want to edit this before the Lakers game comes on. So those NBA playoffs, man, you were right. Uh, I just can't resist them anymore. It's, Luckily, it's only the two series now, but yeah, the Knicks are out. Islanders been out for a while, so like I definitely have more time to do other things. But there was a while there with Islanders, Knicks, Lakers, and just uh, like random games that intrigued me. Where yeah, the NBA playoffs have been good. You just it's turn it on and you're like, okay, I guess I'm watching this for three hours. It is a it is a fucking grueling process. NBA playoffs, yeah, just dude. playoffs in general, hockey, yeah, any yeah. game seven. Uh, series that like where all the rounds go seven yeah you get tired of probably of facing off against that same team dude they're playing like another half a season like yeah well for hockey and nba it does go about two more months right it's the longest playoffs i think of any sport both of those sports yeah football kind of whizzes by yeah you know it's uh, it's just easier it's just one game and baseball with the shorter opening series so yeah it's a real season as my brother-in-law always likes to say it's the preseason, and then the regular season is basically the postseason. 162 games is obnoxious. <laughs> They'll never cut it back, though, because the numbers, the purity there. I'll tell you what, I don't like the pitch clock. I'm out. I'm really? out, on the, You're out on the pitch clock? I'm out on the pitch clock. I, I like the pitch clock. I haven't sat through one single game this whole season. But I'm when you out. finally <laughs> do put it on, you're like, oh, this is... this is fun. I don't like it for the in-person experience. No, I went to a game yeah. this year, and it was like... Oh, so it's you, over? Like you're being rushed out. Like, yeah. thank you for coming. That's the worst. You ever go to a no, restaurant? No, it's the worst when you're the host and they won't leave, right? I went to a restaurant once and they, like, kicked us out. They didn't kick us out, but they're like, hey, can we, like, use this table and, like, you can sit by the bar and have a drink? I'm like, like, they bought it, like, it was free, but I'm like, you just, I don't feel like you just don't do that. Yeah, that's crazy. And yeah. it was, like, a nice place, too, so, like, t- taking my time and, like, yeah, like I just spent a shit ton dude. of money. Right, yeah. No, I want another drink. It's like, yeah, if we want to hang well, out get it at the bar. relax oh, and... That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fucked up. Unless it was like a high... I, like, I wish it was like a high roller. It's like, we normally don't do this, but, you know, Mr. James is here. <laughs> LeBron? No. He's a stockbroker down the street. It's Hamas Rodriguez, Colombian soccer superstar. All right, guys, we'll see you on the next episode of the Nerd Soup Podcast. Thank you for listening, for liking, for sharing, for subscribing, for pledging to our Patreon. LeBron James is here. Oh, shit. And this is fucking brawny. <laughs> oh, he's so pissed. LeBron James Jr.
Wow, that was probably our best review yet. Hey guys, Aaron the Nerd Soup Monkey here with a brief shameless plug before we end the video. Do you ever feel like you don't have an adequate amount of nerd soup in your life? Like you're going to bed hungry and yearning for the nonsensical yet entertaining nutrients our podcasts provide? Well, we've come up with the perfect solution. The Nerd Soup Fan Question Podcast, exclusively available to our Patreon supporters. You can sign up now by visiting patreon.com slash nerdsoup, and for the price of only $1 per month, you'll receive exclusive access to our weekly podcast, where we answer your questions that don't make it to the main show. And while you're there, you can check out the other rewards we offer to our patrons, like stick stickers, mugs, t-shirts, behind-the-scenes footage, and appearing in the credits at the end of our videos. And that's exactly what we're gonna do right now. Roll the names of the nerds who make Nerd Soup possible. The reason why the crypto crash didn't send our lives spiraling down a black hole of no return. Alright, I'll stop talking so you can listen to this jazzy-ass music while checking if Bo spelt your name wrong in the credits.